Good day and welcome to the basic life support video. Today we're going to be talking about head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust, and then all the basic airway adjuncts, NPA, OPA, BVM, and airway suctioning. So first we're going to start off with head tilt, chin lift, and jaw thrust. So head tilt, chin lift, as it sounds, we're going to tilt the head and we're going to lift the jaw. The purpose of this is to lift the tongue off the back of the airway so that the airway is clear. It also allows us to see what's going on there better and it also allows us to assess if the airway is patent or not. This is for a patient who does not have a suspected spinal injury. What we do for a patient with a suspected spinal injury, we're gonna put our thumbs onto their chin or their cheeks or their zygomas, and you're going to lift the mandible with your index fingers, and then you're going to push the mandible away. This is actually quite painful for the patient, but if they are unconscious and not responding to pain, these are the people that we're going to be doing it for. This allows us to do the same thing by lifting the the mandible up, we are actually lifting the tongue up, which then lifts the tongue out of the way of the trachea. So head tilt, chin lift for the patient who doesn't have trauma, and the jaw thrust is for the patient who has trauma. Next spot is the adjunct. So let's go to the OPA, so oral pharyngeal airway. What this does is that this lifts the back of the tongue up, so we place this in like this, and what it does is it keeps the tongue up and out of the way of the trachea, as you can see, and therefore keeps the tongue away from blocking air movement. So if the patient doesn't have a patent airway, this can create a patent airway. How do you measure it? So from the teeth to the corner of the jaw, as you can see, that's too big. It's going beyond the corner of the jaw. So just remember that color doesn't always tell you if it's the right size or wrong size. Different manufacturers make different colors. Therefore, we can't say, well, A, the size yellow is this size yellow. Different companies make different sizes. So which is the right size? There we go. So from the teeth to the corner of the jaw, how do you insert it? So you're going to rotate, going in the wrong way around until you hit the soft palate. You're going to then turn and put it in. It sits at the teeth. So why do we do this? If you do stick it in just like this, you actually have the chance of pushing the tongue down into the way of the trachea. And so we want to avoid that. We rather want to go like this, and then we actually avoid pushing the tongue down entirely. So there we go. If it's too big, it can occlude the trachea and get in the way of the airway. If it's too small, it's not gonna do the job and could become a choking hazard, especially when you're dealing with children. Let's go to NPA, or nasopharyngeal airway. The OPA, this is the NPA, so nasal pharyngeal, so it actually just goes down the nose. How do we measure it? Measure it from the, from the tip of the nose to the tragus. So of the ear, that's too big. There we go, nose to the, to the tragus. This, what are the benefits of this? Well, this can be used in a conscious patient. So it's not going to cause a gag reflex as long as it's not too big. This, you cannot use in a conscious patient because it will cause a gag reflex. That's not what you're wanting. How do you insert this? See, there is a bevel. So the bevel is now facing towards me, it's facing up. So whenever you put it in, you wanna put it into the nose with the bevel facing the septum of the nose because of the blood supply to the nose. So how do you insert it? You actually want to aim straight down to the back of the head. You don't want to aim where you've probably seen people do this because they think that that's how the nose travels. It's not, if you look at a diagram, the nose travels straight down. So we can pull back the nose a little bit, get it in there a little bit, and we can just push straight down. That's how it's in. How do you know that it's in properly? Well, once it's within the right length that you've measured, then you can put it in. Some of them do come with a pin. The purpose of the pin is to actually measure how deep it's supposed to go. If it's the right diameter but too long, you can put a pin in it and therefore stop it from going too far down. If you want to put it into the other nose, remember the bevel needs to face towards the nose, so you want to rotate it so the bevel's facing the nose. Remember, go straight down, rotate, 180 degrees, and push down. Can be used in a conscious patient. Uh, what does it do? It just increases the airflow to the airway and therefore assists with ventilation, especially if someone has trismus or just has a generally blocked nose and we're trying to increase that movement. Let's go to the BVM. So the bag valve mask or BVMR or Ambu bag, different names, different places. Go with what the manufacturer named it. So that was the original Ambu bag, but uh, BVM or BVMR, which is a bag valve mask reservoir, BVMR or a BVM. So how does this device work? When I squeeze it, 
air comes out of it. So this we use to manually ventilate someone. When I squeeze, <laughs> air comes out of the top that goes into the patient. If you see that there's a little duck a valve in the top there that opens when we squeeze. And so when we ventilate, air comes out. And then when the patient then exhales, the patient's air goes back through the mask and then comes out of this valve that circulates here. So therefore, there's no CO2 going back into the BVM. When I ventilate, air is pulled from the reservoir into the BVM, and therefore we're pulling 100% oxygen because this is plugged into your O2 tank at about 15 liters per minute. We're wanting this reservoir to be at least two thirds inflated all the time. So even in between ventilations, this reservoir is at least two thirds full. So that when we let go, air is sucked from the reservoir into the bag, which then puts air into the patient. If this is empty, as you can see, there's valves at the, at the back here. So if the reservoir is empty, it can still draw in room air. This can be used without oxygen, but therefore you will be giving 21% oxygen, which is what is in the air at the moment. Two things that are important is that this device delivers volume and pressure. The amount of volume in a BVM is about a liter and a half, depending on the manufacturer. This is an adult BVM. You do get pediatric BVMs. This BVM has, a, has got about a liter and a half of air. The amount of air we're wanting to give is about 500 mils, so one third of the bag. So we should always be squeezing about one third of the bag. If we're squeezing too much air, we can cause damage to the patient and be hyperinflating or hyperventilating the patient, which is what we're wanting to avoid. The other thing to be conscious of is that this also provides this volume and pressure. These are not joined or synced. They're completely different values. So I could press this slowly and I have less pressure but lots of volume, or I could push fast and rapid and have high pressure and low volume. So we need to keep low volume and low pressure. They pretty much say that the less number of fingers you have on the bag, the less pressure you can apply. So if you're just pushing two fingers like this, you're gonna be really minimizing how much pressure you're giving. You'll often see this 10 finger Lots of ventilations, that's what we're trying to avoid. That's way too much pressure. There's a pop-off valve at the top here. So if I block the outlet, <laughs> you see that there's pressure coming out there. That's normally set to about 30 centimeters of, of water, which is actually too much pressure. If I am ventilating a patient and that pop-off valve is popping off, I am already putting air into the stomach because the cardiac sphincter, which is the sphincter on the top of the stomach, which then connects to the esophagus, that opening pressure is actually far less than 30 centimeters of water. And therefore, when we have ventilated and we're having air coming, or when we have this popping off, it means we are, are already putting air into the stomach. Air can either go into the stomach or into the lungs. So that's not what you want to do. Okay, let's get on to how to use it. So this is your mask. Your mask just goes over the face. There's this pointy bit, which is for your nose, and that's for your mouth. That fits on top of the face, and then your BVM will obviously go on top of that. So a BVM should be used by two people. That is the most effective and the safest way to do it. However, we are sometimes limited by our resources. So how do we do this? So you do a CE grip. So you see I have a C and I have an E. So the C goes over the mask like this, and the E grabs the mandible. Remember, this is not a pushing the mask onto the face. This is a bringing the, the jaw into the mask, all right? And then you can ventilate. And you'll see that we have some air movement into the lungs. Not a whole lot, but we are know that we're giving enough if we see chest rise. So if you have more than two people, I'm just going to take this off because it's easier for you to see. If you have two people, what you can do is you, you can do something called a double CE grip, which is where you just put two CEs on top of each other, and this then gives you a lot more strength than a much better seal. This will guarantee a good seal. We only have good ventilation if we have chest rise. All right. If this is not working, what you can also do is a two thumb technique or a thenal eminence. It's the fancy word for two thumbs. Put that on top of the mask and you're gonna grab the mandible with your index finger, which is your strongest fingers, rather than this grabbing with your three weaker fingers. This also works really well if your hands are a little bit smaller. You then are putting the face and mandible into the mask. This is also how you do a jaw thrust and ventilate someone at the same time. So you're going to put your two thumbs down, fingers going to grab the mandible and lift the mandible up. You see, I don't have to do any sort of head tilt chin lift. Here, we're doing a head tilt chin lift. All right. Good practice is to use a BVM with two people. 
even in cardiac arrest, if someone's doing CPR, another person can be holding a double CE grip and the other person can do their 30 compressions and then give a ventilation. That is good practice. Okay, let's quickly jump into the last thing, which is suctioning. So you generally have two methods of suctioning. You have a hard tip and a soft tip. They have slightly different purposes. So this would be plugged into a suction unit. It's gonna be very noisy if I turn it on. These can be sometimes be quite tricky. Sometimes there's a little hole in here that if you don't put your finger over the hole, it's not going to suction anything out of here. So if you just look at the device you have or be familiar with what you have, that you'll see that sometimes there is a hole. There we go. But you see, yeah, this one has no hole and this one has a hole, which means that if I put the suction onto this and I turn it on, it will start suctioning. If I, if I put suction onto this, it's not going to suction unless I cover that little hole with my finger. I'll explain why now. How should we be suctioning? So this is blind suctioning because I'm not looking into the airway with my laryngoscope at this moment. So why that hole is nice is because it's nice to sometimes be able to turn on and turn off the suctioning, which you're just able to do with your thumbs. Let me demonstrate with this. This is a pediatric suction. So how do we know how like far or how deep we should go? You can just go blind, but then you don't know how far you're going and you don't quite know what you're pushing on because you can't see. So if you quickly take a quick measurement, the same as a OPA would be measured from the teeth to the corner of the jaw, you have a rough estimate. So if I grab it from there, then I know I can go too far. But if I grab it from there, then I know I'm not really going to go too far. So now I know that I can pretty much do that quite safely and know I'm not going to be pushing on vocal cords or the trachea. That's really safe. The issue is that sometimes there's really like chunky things in the airway. So let's say someone's just had a meal and now they're vomiting. Uh, there might be large objects like meat or you know sweet potato or vegetables in the airway. And therefore, if this gets stuck on a piece of vegetable and I pull out a piece of, you know, whatever, fruit or meat, that fruit or meat is now stuck on there. And now how do I take that off? That's the problem. That's why with this device, you have a little hole here, which means that I can stick it in and I know it's not suctioning yet. I can then block the hole, suction, and if I hear it get stuck on something, I can pull that something out, tilt it over and let go of the hole and the object on the other end will fall off. So that's why having a hole is really useful. Also, some people don't know that there's a hole, and so therefore they're just trying to suction, trying to suction, trying to suction, and nothing's working because that hole is not being blocked, which you need to do. Just check your own equipment. That is the hard tip suction, also known as a yankow. This is called soft tip suction. These are measured in French, French, um, French diameter, so different sizes and length, and so you can have like adult one or pediatric or even a neonate one, really tiny. These are for suctioning a little bit deeper or through objects. So if the patient is intubated, this can go through the tube, or if there is just a little bit of blood at the very bottom, this can be really easy to suction little things out of the bottom of the airway. This once again has a little hole, because it's really useful. So if you don't block that hole, so the suction gets attached here, this gets blocked with your finger, so this here, we can then put through the OPA and we can then turn on the suction. And while we suction, we pull out. We can stick it down the mouth, side of the mouth. And you can get stuff out. This, you can't suck a lot of volume out and you also can't suck bigger things. Um, this also, you can't suck a lot of big stuff out, but you do get ones that do have a much bigger um, inlet, which is quite nice for getting chunkier, bigger things out, like peas. So we can stick this down the NPA, and we now know that we're at the back of the throat, and so we can then block the hole. And while we're blocking, we then pull out. And that is then good suctioning. The last point I'm gonna make, which is also probably one of the most important points that I'm gonna make is the longer you're suctioning, the longer the patient is apneic. You can't be suctioning and expect the patient to be breathing. 10, 15 seconds at a time. Same thing with this, especially if they're intubated, you're gonna take them off the ventilator, stick this down the tube, and try and suction. The longer you're doing this, the longer they're not breathing. Be very aware of that. That is your adult basic airway management.